Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I am your host, Etienne De Bruyne. CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products, building incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Siggy? Hey, Etienne. <laughs> Thank Welcome. you for inviting me here oh today. Oh my goodness, no brainer. Thank you. So you're you're in the CTO studio. Wow. It's the name of this podcast. Oh, that's do you awesome. Like that? Yes, I do. The CTO studio. It's an honor. Yes, you and I met each other about a year ago, right? Just under a year ago. Yeah. At the start of forever week. though. It does. <laughs> We've done so many things together since then. We have. So you joined as one of the very, very few female CTOs mm. in seven CTOs. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I'd love to see more women. Uh, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little lonely here, <laughs> surrounded by men. I've been surrounded by, by men my entire engineering career. Doesn't that suck? Um, no, I wouldn't say suck, but it would really be nice to see more women. And why don't we see more women? That's a great question. Um, I was actually talking to a friend of mine who is graduating uh, computer science from UCSD, a woman who's graduating and who I'd like to hire. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about the, um, you know, the, the uh, composition of the students at UCSD and she was saying, that she's also noticed that there were very few women in computer science. So you can't, you can't expect to have very many CTOs if you don't have very many, many but even students. even in 20, in the, in the, this day and age, we're still graduating very few women computer science degrees. That was her experience. <sighs> yeah, I know. I, I would really like to see it change. I just think that this industry could use fresh perspective and views and problem solving and I know communication if if for nothing else in diversity because w just as many women use technology as men do and yet you have mainly men designing it seems a little unbalanced and I spoke with someone who said uh, I think she had a stat that for the most part, women are the ones who make the household purchasing decisions. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And yet men are designing apps to... <laughs> to present these products I to mean, women. It's a, it's, a, it's a gross oversimplification of things, but I, I would love to, to see more women in our organization. I think we have maybe four or five companies... And yet we're about almost 100 companies in seven CTOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you and I did uh, uh, some hackathons together. Yes, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. And so the approach was, uh, we call it 1618. Yes. And it's a, uh, it's hackathons designed to to help people understand sort of the basic tenets of computer science so l logical thinking complexity algorithms data and um, we had a lot of fun with that and we've we saw quite a few students go through that um, I would call it sort of the pre-alpha stealth mode of the hackathon and it was still pretty good one thing that struck me though was how often how often you had to sort of help me sort of tone down my feedback, hmm. <laughs> which I found um, a liberating to be made aware of my sort of approach, but b um, fascinating, you know, to have to have sort of blind spots in that area where you complimented me and then I was able to compliment you, and I, I think the male female thing had a thing to do with that. I, I think so too. I really enjoyed uh, those sessions. You had fantastic feedback. 
I think that um, the the only thing that I really brought to the table uh, with with what I was um, you know balancing you out with was how that feedback was delivered. So I and I, we had quite a few quite a few women in those hackathons, right? Which was yeah. encouraging. Yes, and and watching them work because we we had them work with uh, with their team members, and it was really interesting when we had two women working together versus Absolutely. a man and a woman, and and it was it was really um, th- that one session where we noticed uh, how the men would dominate the conversation, and we would have to go in and moderate that. That was very interesting. And to think uh, how even at that early stage of their careers, we can actually have that uh, that influence. Mm-hmm. Like just be aware that you're you're answering every single question without having consulted your partner. You know whether it's male or female, it's sort of that heterogeneous team spirit. You know. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times uh, um, people neglect how much of the soft skills you really you really need to be an engineer and be effective as part of a team. Exactly, not just not just being a lead, but actually just being part of the team. Yeah. So you are the CTO of Kelvi. Yes. K e l v i. Yes. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> And uh, so tell me, uh, before we get into how you landed that role and your sort of your journey to get there, what does Kelvi do and sort of what is your role as CTO? Sure. So Kelvi is focused on um, cryotherapy and heat therapy that is targeting um, physical therapists and trainers when they're working with patients and athletes and um, and it's it's a it's a it's a portable device. It's rather small, a little heavy, but rather small. <laughs> and you apply a wrap to the body part. And the innovative thing about the Kelvy console is that it doesn't require any ice to cool. Uh, and it's all done electronically through, uh, through little squares that you change the, uh, the temperature for electronically. So you're basically speeding up and slowing down electrons. Pretty much. Really? Yes. 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 So, what is the what is the what is the molecule? Or what is the what is the, the the material that is being? Well, it's called the Peltier effect, um, and so your P E L T I E R, I think. Peltier effect. Okay. Yeah, what is Peltier that? Peltier effect. Um, it is. Uh, it is the. If, I, okay, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not going to venture to explain that here because I'm going to get it wrong. <laughs> but um, but it's a way of uh, of and and actually um, there are other uh, devices that use the same effect, um, like the um, oh I forget what they're called, but uh, they use them in biotechnology um, for heating and cooling samples. And uh, so you're basically uh, moving current through. Uh, through these little squares and you're exciting electrons which creates the heat and then you're pulling energy out which uh, creates cooling and we do have uh, th- there is a, a system that allows uh, the the heat to uh, to more quickly dissipate the material through the material through the material and through uh, water channels but but the uh, there are water channels there are but in contrast, the uh, the other uh, other therapeutic devices actually need ice in order to cool. Mm. We don't. And it's and and the 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 really cool thing is that you can shift from from heat to cool. So you can go from like a um, forty one degree treatment to a hundred and two or three degree treatment in seconds. And back. And back. In seconds. In seconds. Yeah, I think that was the thing I saw on the website was just how almost instant that yeah. heat transfer is. Yeah, it's really cool. If you if you if I had one here, you put your hand on it, and it's just and what amazing. What is the uh, what is sort of the and this might be outside of your field, but what what is the 
uh, average cycle length between that heat and uh, cold transfer? Is it, uh, is it seconds or is it minutes? or When you're applying it to a patient, yes. it's typically a 20-minute cycle. 20 minutes of going hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, or... No, 20, 20 minutes, minutes hot, cold, 20 yeah, exactly. Oh, 20 okay. minutes at one temperature, then you do a contrast to the other temperature, and you can cycle that up to 20 different times. Wow. And it, it, you have to plug it in, right? I mean, it, you're plugging it into a, a power source, so or does it, it have a battery for the front field? Both. So is Calvi, is this, uh, is this appliance... Um, deployed in like sports stadiums or, or, or sports authority or nutritionists or the physical therapists around the country or um, it, it's not intended for home for a consumer it's not a consumer device it's a medical device and it's intended to be prescriptive by okay. physical therapists and physicians okay so it's governed by sort of it's regulated uh, yes okay yes it's an FDA okay device um, yes. so now this is a an interesting space to get to your role as CTO uh, because this is a embedded space and a software space, right? You're, yes. you're combining two teams here or two technologies. You're having yes, so, multiple teams, yes. So can you talk a little bit about your role as CTO and how you know how you're how you're showing up in the executive room? Uh, as part of the C-suite, and then also um, how you, what your teams look like and what you're build and how you're building it. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, Kelvy is a startup. So when we say executive room, it's really <laughs> in, in air quotes. <laughs> but um, when the three of us go to Starbucks, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, or get on the phone. Um, uh, so my role evolved uh, at Kelvy. They first brought me on because they didn't really have any software expertise in-house, and they were working with a few external vendors to um, provide them with software services and hardware um, electronic services. And they were running into a lot of issues because as you, or as people know, uh, medical devices are highly regulated. And so you need to, uh, A, maintain a quality system, you have to document everything, uh, as well as have enough knowledge to do a um, intelligent risk assessment of the system. Everything is risk-based in, in medical. Um, and they really didn't have that, uh, that know-how in-house, and they realized that. So at first I started um, as a potential part-time, very part-time. And then um, as, as we had a few conversations, they brought me on as their half-time CTO uh, through my consulting company. So I consult with, uh, um, with other companies as well. Um, so at, that, at that point, if I can interrupt, at that point... Did they know they wanted a CTO or did they not no. know what they wanted? They, they didn't know. They just knew they needed some technical help or? They knew they needed somebody in a high level position. They went out looking for a CTO. I don't know that they really knew exactly what they needed and how much of a CTO's time they would actually, they would really need. And what do you think, just so I can belabor the point a bit, what do you sure. think, what did they run into where they realized, you know, oh shit, we need some help? Um, mm. Because obviously they got to a certain point without that role. Yes. So obviously they solicited the help of dev shops and hardware shops or whatever. Yes. What was, it, what was the problem that they started running into that, that made them go on that search? Or is that before your time that you don't really know? Or do you have a sense of what the issue was? I think they had, uh, they were running into communication issues with the vendor. So the vendor that they chose was um, was a poor communicator, which was, you know, it's it's bad always, but it's especially bad when the people who are um, who are trying to develop this product don't are not very good software people and so you don't have that education coming from the vendor and when you know when you're trying to commercialize a product uh schedule is important 
and cost. And so they were running into a lot of scheduling issues where things weren't delivered on time and things were becoming very, very costly, both from a time perspective as well as from a dollar's perspective. And this being a hardware product makes it, you know, sort of compounding effect. Um, you have yes. a vendor, they probably have vendors uh, subcontracting things out. And having, you said, to write the software for this device that they were building, right? Yes, yes. The, yes, there were compounded issues. The main functionality was designed and developed in-house and they had a sort of in-house mechanical engineer as well who was designing the uh the commercial box so that they had in hand the problems they were running into uh were so were firmware development um they have a touchscreen console so there was complexity that was uh architected on top of uh, on top of interfacing with the temperature sensors and uh, all the other components that needed to be um, needed to be controlled by the firmware and communicated on the front end. And in addition to this touchscreen, we also have mobile applications. They attempted to develop this initial mobile app through the same vendor that was doing their firmware. This vendor was a wrong vendor to develop the mobile application. Which to your founders, they would have said, well, they built the machine, let's just have them build the software. Exactly. No brainer. Exactly. And Seem yet seemed like a you know done deal, right? Um, it didn't work out so well. And so after spending thousands of dollars, I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars on the mobile application, they realized that this wasn't the way to go. And so, they then started looking for additional resources and that's when I came in. So they had already done a discovery period with uh, one vendor when, when I was brought on board. We explored the possibility of bringing on full-time employees that would, um, that would be able to build out the app and be part of the Kelvy team, the intrinsic team. But because of schedule, we made the decision after after I interviewed and spent time with the company that they um, that that did the discovery and was happy with with their level of competence and the and the the um, the agreement of how we were going to manage the source code, manage bug tracking, manage documentation, and uh, communicate. It was a night and day experience for Kelvy once we brought this team on board. So it was it was a completely different experience. Uh, they ended up w the the first app was I mean nothing nothing uh, against uh, React Native, but it was all written in React Native, and we decided that we were going to use a um, a, a .NET stack. So uh, so the developers developed on top of Xamarin. We built out four different applications, I should say two applications for iOS, two, appli two of the same applications for Android. So four applications in three and a half months using Xamarin, using the Microsoft stack, using Azure with a continuous integration engine and, uh, and the builds pushed out to, um, to alpha tests on uh, Google Play and on TestFlight. So does the, uh, the, the, the medical device, the, this, this temperature device, push data to, the, to a, a service and then the mobile app reads that data from? No, it's actually... Is it uh, for Bluetooth or? It, it actually works. It's, it's over Bluetooth. So, so the mobile app is connected to the device over Bluetooth mm -hmm. and the main function for the mobile app is to allow a trainer to um to program different treatments so the the, bo the box itself doesn't doesn't change between hot and cold automatically you can start a manual treatment you can stop it but the mobile app allows we'll set the program yes exactly and so a therapist can go in and create a treatment for a patient and then push it from the therapist app so the, the therapist would have a library of treatments and a set of patients 
and then they can prescribe that treatment to the patient. So they can invite them and send them the treatment. The patient can then sit with their mobile app. They can put the wrap on themselves and then they can select the treatment and go start. And so then their mobile app is then driving the the device. Yes, it starts a device. Now you can walk away. I mean, we have to, Uh again, it's a medical device. My next question. (laughs) Everything everything is risk-based, right? So so the therapist can start the, 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 the treatment and then walk away to the other room and then um, not be able and then lose connection to the device, but that's okay because you can always stop the treatment on the device. And once you start the treatment, the device will continue uh, to um, to administer that treatment that was. So, sent. are you relying on the mobile app to switch and execute the plan, or does the plan get downloaded to the device and the device executes the plan? Yes. Both. The device. Uh, the device executes the plan. So you can lose connection. And the device will still know when to switch from hot to cold. That's the idea, yes. Yeah. So you had the 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 hardware vendor who built the firmware and and sort of terrible software. Yes. If I can call it that. Yes. And then you they brought in another vendor to now do the mobile app builds, right? Yes. And so your role as so they brought that in as you were sort of coming in as a part time CTO. Yes. And so now you run these two teams. Is that is that sort of these two vendors? Yes. So um, and and there have been there have been um, uh, developments since I've joined. Um, and we decided that we were going to um, to to stop the development with these. Uh, with the vendor that is developing the firmware and the hardware because of the communication uh, difficulties that we were having as well as some other things. Um, So one of the questions that you had that uh, um, that were on the on the uh, sheet (laughs) that I was sent over for this for this interview was my challenges. So what were the top two challenges that I had as the CTO of Kelvy? The first challenge, of course, was, you know, was the, the picking the technology and, and figuring out the technology gap. The second one was now, okay, so we're going to stop working with this vendor. Now what? Right. So I had to come up with a, uh, with a good plan um, and present some options to the CEO and to the rest of the management team to allow them to move forward without losing uh, substantial amounts of time. Mm. So the uh, so did you did you let go of the vendor for the hardware? For both hardware and firmware. And did you replace them with someone else? Yes. And so they basically got. The and they they're already in place. This happened within a week and a half. Uh, we found we found uh, a new hardware engineer. We found a new f- a new team of firmware developers. How did you How did you find them? Network. Tell it's us all about, about networking. It's all about the networking. So what do you do to have that kind of network? Seven CTOs is a great place to be for that network. <laughs> I mean, it's been invaluable. But you didn't... But actually, I ha- I've i known these people from, um, and I've worked with them before. Uh, because you were with uh, a company called Pet Wireless before this, right? That's exactly right. And that's that's where I knew them from. Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> And just just for some context, what was Pet Wireless? What were they doing? Pet Wireless. What, they still do it, right? Are they yes. still do, okay? Yes, it's an IoT device. It's a uh, consumer uh, electronic device that um, monitors uh, pet health in the home. Specifically, feline, right? Specifically, feline. Yes. So activity tracking and. It it is a method of activity oh, tracking. Are we talking about the litter box? We are. Yes, yes. I remember now. <laughs> that so, nasty, nasty thing. Yes. <laughs> so it's a wonderful thing. It's it's basically a platform that sits underneath the litter box, and uh, and the cat goes in and you, it, and and puts weight on it, moves around, and so it's it's basically a very smart, complex uh, scale that. Oh, so collects the, information uh, and including the weight of the cat including the weight wow. of the cat yes what it leaves behind how many times it visits wow. uh, per day yeah don't you think that all cats should be able to use the toilet 
<laughs> for number twos? <laughs> you mean like training them? Uh, I've never tried training my cats. I have, uh, how many cats do you have? I have four cats. I had one and the litter box was an absolute awful experience for me. <laughs> But I be, yes. very seriously considered getting a cat again. But one of my prerequisites was I was going to teach it how to use the toilet. Well, you can find uh, you can find kits. Yes, and and, yeah. I, and and it's it's a thing. I mean, it's yes, a thing, right? It is. Yeah, I've never tried. Yeah, I heard. Uh, obviously, there's the you know people who think it's a good idea, people who think it's a bad idea. Uh, for the most part. The sense, the sense I got was that it wasn't a great idea f- to do that to cats. I don't know. But I could tell you that Talia wouldn't be as effective if your cat was using the, ta- the toilet. <laughs> Talia is a pet wireless maybe, product. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Talia could be adjusted for humans. Oh, yeah, for sure. Maybe you could but you but you would seat? have to build the toilet seat and you'd have to figure out somehow to measure the quantity that was <laughs> being excreted. <laughs> wow. Yes. On to, On uh, to uh, other topics. So tell me with uh, so Kelvi um, is it a, is it a space that is is it blue ocean? Is it red ocean? I mean, is there a lot of competition? Is it, it seems pretty uh, innovative. Um, but you're saying there are systems out there that require uh, like water, uh, fluid or uh, ice. This is a unique system in that it does not require that. So correct. So are you? Uh, how do you manage? So I think that are you? Are there two founders? I think there are three. I know two of them. So what's it like to come in as a CTO at sort of this stage? If you could maybe, uh, you, you gave us some of the challenges you had around execution. Could you just, the challenges relationally, uh, you're sure. obviously coming into uh, a leadership team that culturally is used to doing something a certain way, uh, where maybe as CTO you have to educate them that this isn't, the way it's really done anymore i mean what kinds of challenges have you had joining good and bad uh at this stage of uh, the startup well etienne that's a great question it really is um it's been interesting most of my career i've worked with startup companies but they're but these companies have been at different stages of their life cycle when you come into a startup as early on um, I don't want to say that they're, you know, they're at the beginning because they have, they have a product that they're almost ready to commercialize. Um, there, but it's a small team. It's a, it's, I think we're maybe 10 people, 11 people. And there's not a, there's not a strong sense of, uh, pomp and circumstance around management. The, you do have to have a uh, a level of um, a discipline around uh, decision making, and you have to provide the CEO with the same kind of information to allow them to make good uh, good decisions based on data. You know, so data driven uh, decision making. But in terms of developing budgets, in terms of long term plan, in terms of having a yearly uh, forecast, and sitting down and having those types of and and putting together processes and you know um uh expenditure processes and things that that come up in our conversations with uh in our conversations in the forum with seven ctos around uh around the discipline and the structure of an organization there there is some structure because there has to be but it's very loose so it, it it's kind of nice, but has its own challenges. Yeah. yeah, it's fascinating for me, and I think you and I have spoken about this. Uh, the the role that the role that we have to play as as tech leads in the C suite, oftentimes, <clears throat> oftentimes we're looking for that uh, anointing of decision making when power and executive decision-making power but 
oftentimes there's just a lack of knowledge that oh I didn't realize that as CTO you you needed this or that I should have deferred this type of decision to you or right. and I think oftentimes we as CTOs misinterpret that um, and then we start feeling excluded and then we leave ultimately when really it was an opportunity to lean in engage and educate yes and that's been happening over time and as a matter of fact I've been getting more and more responsibility from uh, from the management team Siggy you manage this Siggy you handle that <laughs> which is which is nice it's a validation that they're happy with uh, with the value that I bring to yeah, the team I love it um, but but at the same time it's um, it it poses challenges because I didn't plan for it so now I have to scramble and plan for it so if I can touch on this since we opened with uh, the male female thing um, has it have has there been any challenge or pleasant surprises around being a female CTO in this organization or do you get the sense that that's not even that you know it's not even noticed it's not even noticed it's, that's uh, awesome. which is wonderful that is wonderful so tell me you um, I kind of want to end off with a discussion around your passion that you and I have discussed quite a bit, which is getting more uh, girls into technology and and um, tell me a little bit about that, where that came from and maybe tie it into your own journey maybe as in your own personal journey uh, mm -hmm. and sort of what you'd like to see happen in the, in the coming years and specifically in this space and how you want to get involved. So my journey has been, um, has, has definitely been affected by, um, by the lack of women in technology, not me personally, but looking around and, uh, and seeing, seeing the, the, the lack of, of confidence that women have into going into STEM fields, uh, sometimes the lack of interest, which I, 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 I don't know if if it's because uh, because STEM is 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 pictured as such a math heavy thing that people say, okay, well, I'm not that good in math or I don't like math that much. But I think what's missing is the amount of creativity that that these fields actually require. And, uh, and allow you to bring to the table. So it's not just an equation, but it's a, it's a, it's a piece of art that you're creating. The, the, the ability to build something from nothing and that satisfaction that comes from having done that needs to be instilled from an early age, both for men and for women. I think it's more instilled with boys than it is with girls, and, and that's... <laughs> that's a shame because girls have as much uh as much ability and as much drive to create as as boys do so um from it, my my journey took many turns and uh and the funny thing is that i rejected computer science early on and then found it when I got my bioengineering degree, got my first job, and then fell in love with firmware. <laughs> and, and the initial rejection was based on? It, I, I don't even know, because I've always been interested in, uh, in biology and kinesiology and, and um, physiology and anatomy, and that, that, really, um, that really pulled me. Um, I don't know what it was about computer science that that just seemed dry. It was also a, a, a pretty new. It's a new, especially. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of the same age. Yeah. The, those days, it was very new, and sort yes. of the oddballs were taking it, and yes. it didn't seem like a real thing. Yes, it wasn't integrated with your no, daily life. No. It was something that was in the fringes. Yeah, I had I did computer science when I was in tenth uh, grade. 10, 11, 12. And, uh, and I remember we had to go after school. We had to go to this other school where they had all these kids from the different schools. So it was a, it was a huge effort to, to get involved with it. 
Um, I kind of, I'm kind of stuck on something you said earlier about confidence. Why going, coming back to girls and STEM slash math slash what, what, what do you mean by it being a confidence issue? Is it a social confidence or is it a intellectual confidence or? I think it's both. I think it's both. I, I don't think girls are naturally pushed in that direction. They're not, it doesn't seem like they're encouraged by society to to value that in themselves and to see that in themselves and and i remember one of the uh one of the women in 1618 mentioning that she had trouble in school with a with an equation that she didn't get right and somehow that stuck into into her mind that she wasn't good in math and it, it, it's a shame because it's okay to get an equation wrong. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Amazing. You know, uh, sort of a sort of a uh, something I was made aware of just the other day. Um, so I'm actively working on this whole disparity, just in my own brain. Like as you can tell from this conversation, also, like what can I do? What can we do? individually and as a community to just bring more women into the tech space. But something I noticed which was, um, which was, which was sad for me was the other day there was this, another SpaceX launch and it was yeah, at that six was o'clock. Awesome. It was at six. It wasn't Falcon Heavy. It was oh, the one okay. after. It was okay. Pairs or something. I didn't, I didn't and it was at 6.30 in the morning. And uh, so I, I set my alarm. I woke up which I was awake by then. And I put it on YouTube and I um, started watching it. And I, my kids usually wake up, our kids up at seven. And my wife wasn't there for some reason. And it was just me and the three kids. And instinctively, I went to my son, son's room to go wake him up to come and watch the launch with me. And I, I picked him up out of bed and I set this little rocket launch and I put him in my bed and I went around to get into my side so we could watch it. And I realized, what the hell am I doing? So then I ran back and I went and woke my daughter up. And I felt so sad that, again, that bias was sort of programmed into me to think of my son for that exposure and that I had to override a, a bias or an instinct that I had through awareness and be, hang on, this is a moment for my daughter as well. The five-year-old wouldn't give a shit. I mean, so I let her sleep. <laughs> but the, um, uh, so I, I lay in bed there with my nine-year-old son, seven-year-old daughter, and we watched this, um, this launch and the active participation that my daughter had was was almost more than my son. And so I I'm just so I feel so sad when I just think about how you know how 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 much energy it takes. Maybe I'm part of an older generation and I'm 45, so I'm not that old. And why is it that I, you know, didn't think of waking my daughter up to come and I had to sort of go that extra energy cycle to remind myself to bring her into this thing. That's really interesting. It's a cool story. And I think that you've learned something and people, people need to go through this. They need to, they need to get educated. They need to see it more. It needs to be more present in our media to bring it out so that it is not an afterthought, so that it is actually part of something that you would do naturally. But for you, it seems to me the way that you're telling the story is very heartfelt and <laughs> it touches me. And I can, I can see that the next time that this happens, you're gonna naturally just go and bring both. Yeah, I, uh, my five-year-old 
Uh, so what I do in the mornings, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound like a great dad, but I actually suck. But <laughs> my, in the mornings, I like to have them sit with me around the aisle while I cook, while I do the breakfast, my wife and I. And, uh, but I want them to sit with me and watch how I, as the man, am cooking. <laughs> uh, I want them to see that dad, it's not mommy that mm-hmm. does the cooking, it's daddies do the same in the kitchen. So, um, but my five-year-old um, just all of a sudden started telling me what men do and what women do. And huh. she was completely in the stereotype of, well, mommies are in the kitchen and daddies, you know, daddies. And I, you know, I was, I was, again, I was so sad that somehow at this five-year-old age, she's, she's ha- gets this from, I guess, from society, from... Even our household, I mean, I, I consider us to be quite an egalitarian household. Certainly not perfect. But to have her feel the need to ramble off to me what the mommies do and what the daddies do was, again, was just a kind of a, kind of a downer moment for me. Well, it's, it's culture, it's television, it's, uh, it's literature, it's cartoons. It's everything that they're exposed to. And there needs to be a more of a conscious shift to change some of that so that it becomes more balanced. Yeah, so possibly the the number of the the the, the fact that women are still not going into these STEM degrees and therefore ultimately becoming CTOs. You know, if you just go upstream to when they were 15, mm-hmm. 10, 5. Yeah. I mean, it's such those are the a ages. pervasive yes. cultural stereotype. Yes. Those are the ages that you need to start influencing. Because uh, once once you're past 18, once you've decided your college career, it's, it's kind of too late. Yeah. It's kind of too late. Well, Siggy, any questions for me? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I did all the talking. It's been wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for thank you for coming. And um, just quickly, any any book that you're reading right now, or any podcast or blog post, or something that you just like to drop with us before we say goodbye. Sure. So so there are a number of things that I wrote down on my cheat sheet, <laughs> but um, I I just have two things that I wanted to to say. I love LinkedIn. It's my it's my go to in the morning, and the I feed. the feed. Um, I look look at my connections. I look at what people have been doing. Reach out, you know, once or twice a week. Maybe if I get busy, it's probably once or twice a month. But but I do keep up with okay. LinkedIn. Um, I love Audible. Mm. I do have a few podcasts that I listen to, but mainly Audible. Mm. I love listening to, uh, I, I have different categories of books that I listen to. Um, the the process, the two process books that I've loved the most have uh, lately have been uh, The Phoenix Project, which is a wonderful project, a wonderful novel uh, around DevOps. Mm. So it's presented in a very fun way, but it's very educational. It's the, a novel? It's a novel. Okay. It's a novel form. I've heard of it. Yes. Okay, and then? Uh, it's a geeky novel. Love it. <laughs> and the other geeky novel is called The Goal, which is around manufacturing. So if you listen to The Goal first, uh, and, and, the, and The Goal is uh, Eliyahu Goldratt, and uh, The Phoenix Project is Gene Kim, Kevin Baer, and uh, George Spafford. If you listen to the goal first, it kind of sets the tune for the pro- uh, the Phoenix Project. Okay. I use Audible a lot, though, to tune out. So I like yeah. to listen to science fiction. I love <laughs> science fiction. Yes. Novels. Uh, right now, I think I'm going to... Uh, what what? I love The Martian. Oh, uh, my yeah. God. That so was such of a Artemis? fantastic... I was thinking of Artemis. Um, but also uh, that that um, the one that uh, Will Wheaton is re- reading on Audible that just is coming out as a movie, um, uh, Ready Player One. Oh yes, yes, yes. So yes. I just what downloaded that. 
Thank you, Siggy. Thanks for being a, an amazing part of Seven CTOs. And thank you for digging into a pretty tough topic with us. Oh, thank you. It's and been wonderful. We're going to keep on chatting. I always love our conversations. Cheers. Have you chatted with a CTO lately?